Okay, so yesterday we started uh, talking about black hole thermodynamics and then we saw how for supersymmetric black holes, um, <laughs> yesterday we just used the extremal limit, uh, one has a definition, I mean Sen has proposed a definition of quantum entropy and I don't know if this is really visible, I can enlarge it a little more. Um, I don't know how to do this here. I guess that's the best one can do. Um, so there were these, so it's, it's all defined in the near horizon ADS2 region. There are these fall off conditions that one puts on the metric and the gauge field and the scalar field. And then you want to integrate over the fluctuations, these, these pieces here. Okay, that's what you want to integrate over. I want to emphasize this because there was some confusion yesterday. I got a few questions. Um, about this. So what I developed in the main part of the story yesterday was the classical entropy. So that's a, an extremization problem and there everything is constant and the on-shell value of the action is the entropy, the Lajano transform of the action. But what we're really after is this. We actually want to do the functional integral. Okay? So I just want to emphasize this and uh, then there was the um, second part of this that um, what we want to do is, whatever your bulk Lagrangian is, you want to, add, so whatever your Lagrangian is, you write the bulk action in ADS2, add some boundary term, add this Wilson line, and then such that you, you choose the boundary term such that this S3 normalized is finite, and then you want to do this path integral for the fluctuating fields. See here, phi graph means all those O of one and O of one, the subleading pieces that you want that are fluctuating, that's what uh, phi graph means, okay? So that was yesterday's discussion. I'm going to switch this off now. Um, start now. So today, I'm going to. So yesterday we gave a very general context. We started with four dimensions, with a simple example of Rajna Nostrum, and then I said that actually this kind of formalism is is more general, applies to any supersymmetric black hole. And that in order to do that more general thing, you have to go to a two-dimensional way of thinking. Today we'll we're, we'll we'll give ourselves a very precise context, and the context is. Um, uh, black holes in n equal to supergravity, and this is uh, exactly the thing that Stefan discussed in his first two lectures. So I'll be talking about asymptotically flat black holes, so ungauged supergravity. So this is a very precise context, and what we want to do is to apply this formalism to these kind of black holes. And these black holes are all spherically symmetric, uh, so I'm just making a choice so as to make the discussion clean. And therefore, we'll always work with four, dimension, four dimensional actions and Lagrangians. Again, I'm saying this because I got some questions which showed some confusion. So whatever system it is, it tells you what Lagrangian you have. Okay? So this was sort of a more general discussion, um, but we don't need to do that. Okay, so. So why are, so it's a class of black holes we're considering, but it's a very general class of black holes. And in fact, uh, these black holes appear in string theory, uh, in type two string theory on Calabi-Yau compactifications. And what you get is an n equal to graviton plus some NV um, vector multiplet, graviton multiplet vector multiplets plus n h hypermultiplets. Okay, so I think this everybody knows. Um, so here, uh, in the graviton multiplet, there is this gravi photon. There'll be some n v gauge fields, a i, and here there will be uh, some number of uh, hypermultiplets, which I'm not going to discuss very much today. And in these vector multiplets, there are also, let me say, it, A1 to NV and X1 to XNV. Those are the complex scalars of the N equal to vector multiplets. Okay? And together, our notation will be uh, AI. Okay, I goes from 0 to NV. Okay? Um, then, as I said, I'll only be discussing ungauged supergravity here in these lectures. 
And the formalism that I'm going to use is uh, the superconformal formalism that Stefan uh, very nicely discussed. And I'll review it because not everybody may be familiar with it. So I'll, I'll take whatever I need out of that. Um, but let me just tell you why this formalism is nice to attack such problems. Firstly, uh, there's off-shell supersymmetry, which means that off-shell means that you don't, the supersymmetry transformations close without using equations of motion. They're auxiliary fields, and they just close algebraically. And this will be crucial later, right, when we start to use localization. Um, this also fairly easily allows for higher derivative interactions. So this um, I'll talk about tomorrow. Today I'll stick to two derivatives. But the formalism, as Stefan, he didn't quite talk about this, but he hinted how higher derivative interactions can be incorporated. It's, it's fairly easy. Um, and it's, uh, this third thing is a consequence of the first two. The SUSY transformations are, I'm just repeating, independent of the action. Okay. And this is nice both technically and conceptually. So technically, Stefan already talked about it a little bit. Um, but as we'll see, even conceptually, this, this fact is going to be very useful in our calculations. Okay. Um, and the theory is based on gauging the n equal to super conformal group algebra um, and let me even say this so in this super conformal formalism I'm going to take um, th this theory is rewritten as so the graviton multiplet is often called the vile multiplet you have NV plus one vector multiplets. <laughs> and NH plus one hypermultiplets. Okay, this Stefan already talked about. The plus one is reflects the extra gauge invariance of the of the theory. So um, the superconformal um, supergravity has many more uh, symmetries compared to the Poincaré supergravity. And this plus one, for instance, um, is a compensator field for the dilatations that you have. And this plus one is a compensator field for the SU2 gauge transformations. You can think about it like that. But in any case, once you fix all the gauge transformations and so on of this theory, you get back Poincaré supergravity with NV uh, multiplets and N NV vectors and NH hypers. All right. OK, so um, let me just briefly remind you of the theory. It's based on gauging this algebra. And of course, it's not just a ga regular gauge theory. You have to put some constraints. Uh, I won't discuss this in detail. But um, if you really want to understand all the calculations you know, in all its depth, you really have to understand these. And I encourage you to look at the original papers. Um, and so let me just tell you what the symmetries are, so the local gauge symmetries are, so there's general coordinate transformation, okay, or, which is the same as the phimorphism. Um, how do I want to arrange this? There's local Lorentz transformations, then, so these are just rotations, local rotations, there is dilatation, which certainly is not present in Poincaré supergravity. Um, and then there are special conformal transformations, which also are not present in Poincaré supergravity. There's an SU2 times U1 R symmetry, and there's Q and S supersymmetry. Okay, all of these are local transformations. Okay. Um, and so these are, you can think of this as based on some, some gauge principle. Okay, and a word about the notation I'm going to use. Uh, and this is important today as well as the next two lectures. 
So my notation is that mu is a space-time index. Okay. Um, a, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, is the tetrad index or the uh, tangent space index. I is 1, 2 is an SU2R doublet. Okay. Um, and these sort of make, so if I have a field with some indices, then these symmetries are manifest, the, the representations are manifest if I have some field. Okay, so the reps are manifest. Uh, and the other symmetries, the U1R, so Lorentz is, as Stefan said, is automatically uh, taken care of by this. So let me even say this. So diff, I'll just remind you, these are all basic things, but let me just remind you, x mu goes to x mu plus c mu. Right, so the mu index tells you how the local translations act. A index tells you how the local Lorentz uh, uh, transformations rotate the field. Uh, and then you're left with, uh, so this one gets gauge fixed. You're left with, or you also have to say how this is, this acts. So this, this one and the rotation and U1R and QNS are not manifest from, the, from just the, the letters here. And so you actually have to tell, say what those things are. So there are tables, if you go look at the papers, the, the, the theory is always presented like this. There are some fields which carry indices here. And then each field, you have to say what are the charges, how they transform under all these transformations. So for example, um, take, uh, so the basic field is the Wilbein, E mu A. So you can see that this has a mu index, so how it translates, it, has, it rotates as a vector. And, but then I have to say what are the charges. So under dilatation, so under dilatation, a mu goes to lambda inverse e a mu. Okay, so it has charge minus one. Lambda affects some local scale transformation. And another example is uh, the x size, the complex scalars in the in the vector multiplet. They have charge plus one under this u one r, and under, under dilatation. Uh, also, they have charge plus one. Okay, so like this, so you can just write a whole table. I just gave you a few examples. Okay, so that's my notation. Okay, any questions so far? Either about yesterday or about this much. Okay. So well, let me t remind you what the field content is. So the field content is, a, as I said, there's a vial multiplet, which has the following fields. So there's the field bind. This is the Gravitino, or rather two Gravitini. Uh, there are two gauge fields, A mu and B mu. Then there's an SU2 gauge field called V mu IJ. So there are three of them. And then there are auxiliary fields, which are T, I, J, mu, nu. And another fermion, chi I, and a field called D, which is a scalar. So, as I said, so this is a boson, this is a fermion. Boson, 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 fermion, and boson. And overall, there are 24 plus 24 um, official degrees of freedom. OK. Uh, this field is, uh, is anti-symmetric. anti self -dual. OK, and we'll be using combinations of the following type, T minus, T minus AB is defined to be epsilon IJ, TIJ, AB or mu nu. Okay, so I'm going to, I might go between, between the two, I mean. I have a question. Just a second. You, you couldn't do, okay, yes. the lecture you choose to do this, but you could also, there is also this dilatation of Which multiplet? It's, uh, it's called the dilaton. Yeah, dilaton, but I think on shell, uh, on cadet, you can do the same theory. Like a different off shell formation. 
how many? Point, if you want to start twisting, I guess you want to use the D. <coughs> Dilaton, right? So how many? Sorry, what, how many degrees of freedom does he have? I think it's also. It's another. It's another formulation of the super. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to stick to this formulation. Uh, what, what was the question? Why you wouldn't use that one? Because in the end, you're going to, I, I don't know how this works, but in the end, I think you're going to use the D for some, you're going to put some value on the D, but maybe if you look at the Dilaton model. Okay. <laughs> then there are vector multiplets. Uh, so that was t minus, and then there was t plus, which is t minus mu nu star. Yeah, maybe in the fourth lecture I'll, I'll, I'll be slightly more general, and my, my answer right now is yes, please <coughs> do go ahead and pursue, pursue that. So a vector multiplet has a mu x, x is a complex killer, then there are two kgini omega i, and then there's an auxiliary field yi ij. That's a symmetric. So there are three auxiliary fields. So I know this is a reminder for most of you, but I don't think uh, that's too bad. And there are 8 plus 8 degrees of freedom. OK? And i goes from 0 to nv, as we said. OK? Then there's also hypermultiplet, which I'm not going to uh, discuss. And you need at least one of them in order to gauge fixed theory. Um, but a full off-shell formulation is not known, but it's fine. So that's my theory. And <coughs> what I want to do now is is to talk about black hole solutions. So the black hole solutions of, of the type that Stefan discussed in the first two lectures, the participating fields are these. So I'm going to take blue chalk. The participating fields are e mu a, t mu nu ij in the vial multiplet, vector, of course, and also the scalars. Okay? And the main difference from this simple rational nostrum solution in Maxwell Einstein that I presented yesterday is really the fact that the scalars uh, play a very crucial role in this theory. Okay? So you'll see in a second. And it's really, it's, it's that. That's the technical difference. And once we just sort of know how to deal with that, uh, the philosophy is exactly what we did yesterday. Okay? Um, so before telling you what the solution is, let me um, write down what the action is. So the action in this case, it's very exciting. Um, unlike uh, in some previous lectures, <laughs> I don't know where Alberto is, that is. <laughs> um, and because of that, I will write it down. Um, so here is the Lagrangian. It's good to write it down once. It's, it's actually quite exciting. So, So first, let me say that, let me say somewhere here, so the action is, the action that I'll write here at two derivative level is completely governed by what is called the holomorphic prepotential by one function of xi. And this is a homogeneous function of degree two. Okay, what that means is that it should scale, if all the xi scale, if you take xi goes to lambda xi, the function should go to lambda square times f. Okay, that's all it means. So it could be x1, x2, or it could be x1, x2, x3 over x0, anything like this. Okay? Um, and my notation is uh, maybe here is fi is ddxi of x, and similarly fij is two derivatives. Okay, give me a phi, xj, uh, sorry, xi, plus i fij 
f a b minus i minus plus and minus here means self and self dual and anti self dual minus a quarter x bar i t minus a b times f minus a b j minus a quarter x bar j t minus a b. Okay, here is this function f i j. They're all functions of x minus an eighth times i f i times f plus a b uh, i minus a quarter x i t plus a b times t minus a b minus i over 8 f i j y i i j y j i j minus i over 32 f times t minus t plus square plus, so these are all written in some kind of holomorphic notation. There are always minuses here, okay? And so that's the chiral part of it, and you have to add the Hermitian conjugates, okay? And that's the full action, okay? At two derivative level, that's the full action. Well, not quite. You have to add the gauge fixing terms, which I won't write down. which you won't see written down in a book immediately because that depends on your context, okay? And if you want, you can add higher derivative pieces. Okay? Okay, so let's look at this action. Um, it looks, essentially it's a generalization of Maxwell-Einstein. What are the differences? One difference, is here, right, in the fact that the, it doesn't start with um, Einstein Hilbert, but there is some, I didn't tell you what K was. E to the minus K is um, defined to be minus I times Xi f i bar minus x i bar f i, okay? So that's a combination which will keep coming up. It's very important. And in fact, let me make one more comment here. That there is a gauge um, freedom in the theory, which is dilatation. And if you remember, I've written somewhere, x scales with charge plus one, and the Wilbein sc scales with charge minus one. And therefore, the metric, which is the square of the Wilbein scales with minus two, and therefore, uh, this combination, G mu nu, capital, which is e to the minus k times G mu nu. So let's go through it slowly. X scales with plus one. F is a homogeneous function of order two, so it's like x square. So one derivative also scales with plus one. So this is plus two, so e to the minus k scales as plus two, and g mu scales with minus two. So this is actually gauge invariant, okay? And so this is the, let me call this the physical metric, okay? And if you make this change of variables, this e to the minus, maybe I should write it uh, here, that just becomes, um, square root of g, that plus this, of course, square root of g times r of g, okay? So that's, this is a transformation many of you might have seen. It's like, so essentially this e to the minus k of x acts like a dilaton. Okay. If you've seen it either in string theory or in some other context, okay? You just make this transformation, and in terms of the physical metric, you have just Einstein-Maxwell as you should, okay? So, huh? Uh, yeah, so maybe I've already solved for something. It's possible. Just maybe I have cheated and solved for just for D, which is algebraic. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, so I said I cheated a little bit. So there should be, a, there are a few more terms here which I um, got rid of because for what we're going to say next, it doesn't matter, but you're absolutely right. 
Um, there are boring terms of the type D. And you can get rid of the boring terms and uh, write it in this clean way. Thank you very much. It's a good point. There are other terms. If you want the full, if you just check off-shell transformations of this, it doesn't quite close. So there is some term here, which is there's a coefficient here, r and minus minus d, and you have to solve it and so on. No, no. So what I'm saying is that you might as well think of it as the full off-shell theory. I didn't. Okay. In all my calculations, I really take the action that you give. Okay. So I just didn't want to clutter the board. Okay. So the cheating is only for presentation. It's not for calculations. All right. Yeah. Here? Yeah. No, so that's the one I think I get after solving the, the constraint. There's some one-sixth usually, and then you solve it and. Sorry, uh, here? Yeah, so because like, I mean, you, I just don't see the transformation that you get, like, I mean, uh, if you rescale the G like that, <coughs> then you don't quite get Einstein, right? And you get, like, in also from the determinant. Uh, let me check. I'm pretty sure of this, but I'll just check this. So these are all good questions. Unless someone knows already, either Stefan or Val or one of the experts, the Dutch school, Flemish school. Um, no, I think it's OK. I think it's OK. OK. In any case, so if there are errors, please go and correct them. I just wanted to show you the form of the action. So that's one difference between the usual uh, Maxwell Einstein. Okay. The teachers, in, in when you begin teaching, they say that you should you should always make small mistakes so that people get engaged and you know, and so on. So that's not why I made it, but it seems to uh, no. But here, there's no mistake. I think. Okay, let's go on. Uh, the other difference, which I want to point out, is that the kinetic terms. So this, the fact that the kinetic term is not canonical is just a gauge artifact. Okay. So you get really the canonical kinetic term for the gravity. For the Vectors and the scalars, it's not an artifact. Really, the kinetic term is, is, a, is scalar dependent. It's a field dependent kinetic term. And that's the main difference uh, in these n equal to two supergravities compared to simple systems. Okay? Um, OK. So now I'm going to talk about the, in this, with this action, there is a BPS dionic solution. OK. And we're just going to go directly near horizon, like according to yesterday's philosophy. So I'll just go near horizon. Um, so the BPS. It's actually one half PPS, okay? So it preserves um, four of the eight supercharges, and the near horizon geometry actually is a full BPS solution in its own right. It's a you can just decouple it, and the metric. I'm just going to remind you of this metric of yesterday. So r square minus one d theta square. I'll be quick now. D r square plus um, do omega to square. Uh, let me write it. Sin square plus sin square psi phi square. So V star. So I'm going to use star for this near horizon system of this black hole. Okay, that's going to be my notation for this. It will be called the attractive black hole. So this particular system of black holes that I'm studying, I'll call it star. So F i is minus i. E i star over 4 pi dr wedge d theta plus p i over 4 pi sine psi d psi. Five. We've seen all this together. And x i is some constant x i star. And there's another field which I said is t minus r t is um, also v star. 
And uh, the other t's are determined by the anti-symmetry and anti-self duality of this. Okay? And these are the only non-zero fields. Uh, these and everything related to this by symmetry are the only non-zero fields in the solution. Okay. Now, we can now ask what is this classical entropy? Okay. And the classical entropy, you can just use this extremization pres prescription that I, procedure that I described yesterday. Here is the action. Here's the near horizon solution. All these are constants. Just plug it in, do a Lajano transform, minimize it. So this is an exercise for all the students. Okay. Slightly involved, but still eminently doable. You'll spend 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, and so what did the classical entropy function did, do? Uh, it did two things. First, it, it told you the values of, of all these constants in terms of the charges. And secondly, it told you what the entropy is. Okay? And the answer is the following. The answer is um, i xi. So the imaginary part of x is p. And the real part of x, sorry, star. The real part of x um, equals this electric field. Okay, so the imaginary part of x, x is complex, is equal to magnetic field, and real part of x is the electric field. Um, so another way to write that is x i star is e i plus i p i over two. Um, so that still hasn't completely solved the problem because I need to now say what is EI. EI should be a function of the electric fields. Um, and that's essentially the difference, as I said. If I have one, uh, just one Maxwell field and a, and a canonical kinetic term, EI e, e equal to Q. The electric field is equal to just charge. Um, but now because of this mixing, uh, because of this field dependent kinetic term, essentially it's a, it's a linear algebra problem. We have um, what is called kinetic mixing, right? So you have to then diagonalize the thing, and this is a solution um, for that problem. And that the solution is written like this. It's I Fi minus, sorry, Fi bar minus Fi. So that's the imaginary part of Fi is given by Qi. Okay, so it's a system of equations. So this is some function of Xi. You have to solve, and, and of Ei and Pi. You have to solve this to get what Ei is. So that's the solution of this problem. Okay. And um, V star equals one. Okay. Sorry, speak up, please. That's correct. So I'm just going to make a comment about that in a second. Yeah, let me just make a comment about this, and then if you have a question, you can ask it. Um, so first, let me just explain the yeah. This this set of equations. Oops, uh, are also called the attractive equations. Okay, sometimes they're called the stabilization equations, uh, depending on which language you speak. Um, and I think Stefan also discussed this, and essentially this goes back a long way uh, to Ferrara. Uh, Karl Loesch and Strominger, and then many other people, also Ferrara Gibbons and Karl Loesch, is that right? Yeah. Uh, and there's an alter so the, historically the, there's an alternative uh, route which was followed to get this equation. So this here, we really haven't used supersymmetry. We just use extremality. And we just use that as an ADS. Now, historically, what was done was just use full BPS solutions, and, and just that turns out to completely constrain the problem. So you get first order equations, and then you get this as a consequence. So the reason it's called an attractor is, as, as was already said, if you think of the full geometry, okay, this is rho star, which is the horizon. And think of xi. So this is some xi star. Okay, if you look at the full geometry, 
these scalar fields can take any value at infinity. Okay? And if you follow the BPS equation, the BPS equations give you first order equations which are like flow equations. And those flows essentially just you know, always bring you, at least when you're within a certain range, uh, to the same value x star. Okay, that's why it's called attractor. It attracts, it's an attractive point. It's just a first order system. Okay. Um, very good. Now, uh, about Jean's question. So note that uh, up here, these equations are not gauge invariant. Right? X has a charge, as I've been saying. So the way I wrote it, it's not gauge invariant. And that was the comment. And indeed, I have, uh, I have chosen a certain gauge in which I write these equations. And there's a way to write this in a gauge invariant way, uh, which I'm not going to do, but it's, it's, it's fairly standard. And the gauge I've chosen can be just thought of to be the fact that V star equal to 1. Remember, V star was essentially, um, so square root of, oops. If you look at the metric, uh, the square root of G is, is V star square. And if I, because the metric itself is charged under dilatation, like we had this discussion here, uh, I could just use that to, to gauge fix. And that's what I've done. And it's in those coordinates. Okay. So it, it might, if you've never seen this before, it, looks, it might look a little funny that um, it looks like the area of the horizon is 1. But that's a gauge artifact, because the real area of the horizon in the physical metric is that times some function of the scalars, like we just discussed. So it's in this capital G. And indeed, um, you can ask, what is the, what is the entropy, um, the classical entropy? Um, continuing this, this program is um, minus pi qi ei star uh, plus 4 pi times the imaginary part of f of xi star. OK? So that's part of the exercise. So that's exercise to show this and that. OK? Um, and again, just to connect to other treatments, sometimes you might see um, at two derivative level, which, which is what we have been talking about so far, um, you can, this, you can show that this expression is also equal to uh, pi times e to the minus k of x star. Okay. Um, and that's in some of the original papers. That's how the entropy was first presented. I think it's a nice paper by well, help me, Gibbons and Kalosh and. Okay, two or three, some subset of Gibbons, Kalosh, Ferrara, Strominger. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay, so so that's the end of one topic. Let me pause for questions. So if you fix the charges at the horizon, mm -hmm. are you guaranteed that the solution will continue? To infinity in a regular way or? I'm not making any claim about that. Um, but I think the answer is yes. If you give the black hole charges such that the, the area is, is positive, then there is a BPS black hole solution. Right? So I don't need to, so the, the charges actually can be fixed at infinity. So the answer is yes, but I'm not using, using that here. There is a question then, because then you have to you have to also tell me whether your black hole is embedded in, in gauge supergravity or in, or in no no in this in this system I have ungauged supergravity, so in this uh, to, in all the, as I said in the beginning I even wrote it down today and tomorrow and the day after I'll only work with ungauged supergravity, given some charges of the black hole this you can measure uh, just at infinity just by one over r square fall off rates. Yeah, but you defined them at the horizon. I did because so so that's what I'm saying. So sorry. So what I, what I didn't write, but I said, was that there is a half BPS dionic black hole. This is the solution that Stefan wrote. And I wanted to avoid repeating yesterday's discussion all over again, so I directly went to near horizon. Okay? Because all my entropy business is anyway we saw yesterday 
is sort of only defined near the horizon. OK, other questions? Um, Very good. So you see two things, there are two remarks to be made. One is that you see that the classical entropy <coughs> has a very nice form for these black holes. So the action, the whole action was at two derivative level, is completely governed by this one function f. It's called the prepotential. It's a very important function that completely determines the theory at two derivative level. That's the thing that tells you how the kinetic mixing takes place. Um, and the entropy should also be only a function of that and the charges, and it's a very beautiful function of that. It's just a Legendre transform of the imaginary part of the prepotential evaluated at these attractor values. Okay. Um, another small comment is, which we'll use later, if you work this out, um, if we, so everything of course is a function of the charges. So if you scale qi, pi to lambda times um, qi pi, uh, you can see that S black hole, this classical entropy, um, scales as lambda square. OK? And the reason is related to the, so of course now this is, this is not a gauge invariance anymore. I'm just saying if you really change the charges, the scales, but of course, technically, it's related to the fact this has, that this has weight two on the scale. Okay, and that's going to be important later. Very good. So, any other questions? Okay, very good. So, let's move on to the quantum entropy now. Okay, so what do we want to do? We want to now we want to fix fall off conditions. Sorry, I mean fix boundary conditions. Fix boundary conditions. These are V star, uh, EI star. Xi star, etc., T star, etc. Okay, and then there are these fall-off conditions that I gave you yesterday that we just saw in poor handwriting over there at the beginning. Um, and then you want to integrate over these fluctuations. So you want Z radius two is the exponential of minus i qi integral i. Um, so ADS2 here means precisely that there are fall-off conditions. And finite means that you have to take the action, there will be divergences, and you have to renormalize it in the sense that I talked about yesterday. Okay. Before I actually, so the goal in the rest of today's talk and, and the next two lectures is to actually calculate this function, functional integral, for this system that I just showed you. So it's a very concrete context. Right? Everything is, so there's, some, there's a black hole in n equal to supergravity with some charges. And you want this function, and this, as we saw yesterday, is only a function of the charges. Okay. Uh, and I want to actually compute this function. Okay. That's my goal. And before I start doing that, I want to make a few comments. But uh, let me also again pause for questions if there's any confusion about what I'm doing. So yesterday I had some question about near horizon versus uh, maybe I'll make the comments and become clearer. Um, Okay, so one comment, the first comment is that if you take, maybe I should repeat the philosophy once more because there was confusion. So what we've done is, yesterday we said that the classical entropy can be understood purely near horizon, right, that we proved. And then there's a proposal that the quantum entropy can also be understood in the near horizon. You can take that as a definition of the quantum entropy. And then in string theory, you'll have to match it with some counting, and you have to make sure that that counting agrees with that near horizon. Um, entropy. Okay, so that's the philosophy. Um, so one comment, one technical comment is, so everything reduces to the calculation is some path integral on ADS2. 
So if you think of Euclidean ADS2, there's always this cutoff, so that's R. Um, and just take a free Maxwell field on this ADS2, you'll find that, um, so just Maxwell field. And solve the equations of motion near the boundary, you'll find that there are two solutions. It's a quadratic thing. And you'll find that two solutions go like this. So A is, let's say A theta, is A times R plus A1 times R plus A2. So there are two modes which solve the equations of motion. One linearly diverges with R. The other one is a constant. Okay. Now, this is the gauge field, and therefore, this This component is the first derivative with respect to R, and therefore this component is the field strength, E, okay, or equivalently the charges. Okay? Those are just related by some algebraic equation. This component is the potential. Okay. Now, typically if you Think of ADS spaces in, in D dimensions. For D greater than 2, what happens is that it also have two, two modes, but the potential modes always dominates at infinity over the, um, the charge mode. This is, in flat space, it's almost trivial. Just take a charge, it goes as 1 over R square. Potential is constant. Therefore, potential wins at infinity, but this is also true at, in ADS space for D greater than 2. Well, D greater than 3, strictly. For D equal to 3, there is some there are two possible choices of boundary conditions, which I won't discuss. But in d equal to 2, you see that it gets flipped. So the charge mode actually dominates over the potential mode. Okay? And therefore, if I want to do path integrals, functional integrals on ADS2, it's that that I have to keep fixed. Okay? So that means that I'm, oops, that I'm in the microcanonical ensemble. OK, that's very important. And that's. The fact that this path integral is only depends is only dependent on the charges. It's a function only of the charges. Yes. It's in your choice which one you keep fixed in the condensation. So like the, the ADS usually you can choose the other one. Uh, no. So just a second. Um, so let me first make a comment and then I'll ask the expert to to answer. Um, so I don't think in ADS you can make a choice. In fact, it's so. The, OK, so the common sense choice or the canonical choice is always that the one that dominates, you keep fixed, right? Because, OK. Now, you can ask what happens when that's not the case. Uh, that's not been studied very carefully. There are some papers by, I think, Don Marolf and maybe, maybe other people here, I don't know. And that's a very strange quantization. You're asking that the subleading term is fixed and the leading term uh, fluctuates. So this is, in general, it's, it's not a good theory. Maybe there are some situations where you can do this. It doesn't make sense, but maybe sometimes you can do it. But Okay, uh, but well, I wanted to say something else. Uh, no, not at all. The standard one is that the dominant one is fixed. No, no, standard in the sense that you know when you have a field in the bar, it's in the window of double quantization. No, but it's not in the in the window of double. That's some very subtle thing you're talking about. So, no. sorry. No, it is. I mean, so, so, so for gates, it's important to mention so both modes are normalized. Yeah, that's 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 one case. Yeah. yeah. That's right. That's right, that's right, that's right. But, um, so in ABS3 and ABS2, both modes yeah. are normalized on the case. Yeah. They're not contained in the same uh, in the, in the thing? Yeah. paper because they consider them three. Right. But actually, you can impose, like also in ABS2, you yeah. can impose like both boundary conditions. Yeah. Just in the other quantization, you need to impose, you need more terms. So it doesn't need to transform. That's right. It only keeps the charge. Yeah. But generically, in, so if I just say, if I, have, if I give you some ADS D, say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever. Right. The easy one to do, the canonical one to do, is keep the dominant one more fixed. Right. That's the one which has. That's that's what my answer was. But there might be cases where where both are allowed. But okay, I'd be very curious to know how to do the quantization in ADS two with the other choice because th that's interesting for a certain reason. Well, we have to the Let's talk about this after the after the thing. Okay. But generically, you always keep only the dominant mode in in ADS CFT. So th there might be situations where you have a certain field of a certain charge and a certain mass, such that you land in a window where you can do both. 
And maybe in low dimensions, that's, that becomes, that window becomes bigger. Okay? But as far as general ADS CFT or ADS path integrals are concerned, the, the most straightforward thing to do is just keep the dominant one fixed this, and, and, and integrate the, the subleading one. Okay? The result of the renormalization, you, you, you put a cutoff, you compute, and you take a limit, etc. Is this well defined or only up to a finite piece? No, but you mean the, the finite piece coming from the boundary? Coming from the renormalization, you put a, you have a cutoff. Yeah, so that's the boundary term, sure. right? The renormalization is an addition of a boundary term, right? The, the birth Lagrangian is given to you. I wrote it down there. So is the final result well defined yeah, yeah. only up to a No, no. So let me answer that. So first let me clarify the question. The bulk Lagrangian is given to you by the theory. Okay? That has some divergences, and you want to renormalize it. Renormalization means that you add a boundary Lagrangian to, to cancel the divergent pieces. Okay? So yesterday I made this comment, but I'll repeat it. In theories where you don't have non -canon where the kinetic terms are all canonical or derivatively coupled, you can easily prove in this case, and I sort of went through it yesterday, that there is no ambiguity. Right? It's a very, let me just tell you again. Take a gauge field, um, it goes like that, and there are maybe one over r corrections. Okay, so if you look at the gauge invariant variable, which is f mu nu, so this constant, that's zero, and that's one over r square. One over r square integrated over the boundary is one over r, so that dies. Constant integrated on boundary is linearly divergence, and that is just killed by a cosmological constant. There is no constant term. Right? And that's true for all gauge invariant variables in the theory, or local gauge invariant variables. Okay? The, the type of variables is not true for, it's just A itself. So the Wilson line itself does contribute a constant term, and if I have something which is just X, it will, and I'm gonna, I, I want to discuss this today, but maybe it'll be tomorrow. But this, otherwise, it's, yeah. And in, in our case, what makes it unambiguous un, un is supersymmetry. Supersymmetry. Okay, so let me just continue with my comments, and we can take up the discussion later. <laughs> um, so it's microcanonical ensemble. Um, and in the, so in the definition, so this is implemented by the insertion of a Wilson line. Right. Uh, what I mean is that if you just do the classical, let's do classical uh, dynamics in ADS2, suppose you have a Maxwell field F mu nu, F mu nu, you do a variational problem, um, you'll get A mu box A mu plus a boundary term. Right. Now that boundary term um, usually becomes zero because you freeze the, you, you keep the potential to be the boundary term looks like something like delta of A dA or something like that. Right? So if you say that that's zero, then this boundary term is zero. But here it's not. You want to keep this fluctuating. So And this is some Q. Right? So this is, in our case, this just becomes delta of A times Q. And so you want to cancel that. And that's exactly what the Wilson line does for you. Okay? So the Wilson line insertion just implements this, this uh, ensemble for you in the gravitational theory, all right? It, just ask me if this was not clear later. It's a very simple thing I'm saying. Okay, now the next comment is, you see you have some functional integral on ADS2 natural to think of some CFT living on this boundary, call this R0, and the partition function of this CFT is just trace of e to the minus beta times the Hamiltonian of the CFT, where beta is just 2 pi R0, that's the, the length, and you see that so suppose H is, uh, let's take a CFT where H is, is, is positive definite. Um, states which have non-zero energy, so this will become, so there's some ground state which starts like that, okay, times, you'll have a trace of one. 
Okay, so this comes from states which have zero energy, and plus there are subleading contributions which don't contribute when R0 goes to infinity. Okay, so that's just 2 pi R0. All right, is the argument clear? Okay, so it's minus e to the minus 2 pi R0 e times trace of 1. Now, if I do a renormal, if I do a, a change of the zero point energy of the boundary theory, I can just make this to be zero. That shift is exactly the same as the, as the fact that I killed the linear, linearly divergent piece in the boundary theory. Okay, so that's, so that's one thing. So after renormalization, so suppose I just say that E naught equal to zero, it means that Z CFT1 is just trace of one over states with H equal to zero, and that's just, just the number of states. Okay. And this is what is called the D micro. Whatever the theory is, I'm saying that, so according to ADS-CFT logic, if there is some ADS-2 functional integral, quantum gravity functional integral, it should be dual to some CFT1. I'm saying that CFT1, you just count the number, what happened, the partition function of that CFT1, it's just the number of states of that CFT. But to find that number, you need to fix the theory. Yeah, so you're given some, so you, 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 you're saying I need to specify what this is. Yes, indeed, in, so in string theory, this is possible. So I won't discuss this, so Joao might discuss some part of this. So, yeah. so typically, you'll have, so what I'm saying is that the e to the, so z ADS2 is equal to z CFT1, so that's supposed to be ADS CFT, is the same as e to the s, s black hole quantum equals d micro. Okay, so this, what Bekenstein Hawking had said at at leading order um, in L Planck gets promoted, at least in the supersymmetric black hole context, um, to an exact statement. It's just that the quantum entropy equals d micro. That's what, that was one of our goals. We wanted something like this. And that statement is just exactly the statement of ADS2, one, one consequence of ADS-CFT, okay? Uh, yeah, can I just finish because otherwise, and then I'll, I'll take both questions, just, just one second. I have one more comment and then, um, Uh, so the third last comment for today is that, oh sorry, there were two quick comments. One is that if the, uh, maybe, I'll postpone, uh, maybe I'll postpone this comment and instead make the fourth comment which now becomes three. Um, so what is s bulk? Okay, that, that's another clarification I want to give. I gave you a Lagrangian here, so s bulk is just the integral of the Lagrangian. But what I really want to do is full quantum gravity. Right? So what I showed you, this action, this exciting action that I showed you here, was a two-derivative action. Okay? But as we already saw yesterday, in general, there could be higher derivative terms in the action, local higher derivative terms. And I should keep all of them. If I really want to do the problem well, I should keep all of them. Okay? So S bulk contains an, you know, all possible terms, so including higher derivative. Okay. And then you might think, so you might think then this is some infinite action, and so it's not even well defined as far as physics is concerned. And in some sense that's, that's true, and that's the problem of the, the fact that gravity is not UV finite. Um, it turns out that for this, particular problem of quantum entropy, because you have supersymmetry, we're going to use uh, the method of localization. And although a priori looks ill-defined, um, because the original functional integral is not well-defined because of this, um, we're just going to follow our nose and just use the same rules of localization. And you get some very nice well-defined answer. And then you can turn it around and take that as a definition of the quantum entropy. Okay, so that's the, um, but I want to stress this that what I told you today is just two derivative, tomorrow I'll do higher derivative, but that's where we are heading. We want to keep all possible terms, and then it's a technical problem how to deal with it. Okay, so I'll stop here, thank you. So, so there were two questions. Uh...